guys, it's me, Blaine with the Diplomacy, and I'm back here with another video. As you guys can see, we're watching something that's a bit different. We are watching a Chernobyl video. If you guys don't know what Chernobyl is about, um, then I really suggest you go and search it up. It's really interesting. And also, it's a really, um, like, it's a re a re one of the most scariest real life horror stories you could say so um if you're interested i really suggest watching this video but if you are not interested and you just don't like the appearance of radioactivity and etc then i suggest you click off and um just don't uh, go away maybe support i d th i don't do these type of videos often anyway any support is most massively appreciated, and this is my first reaction. I have watched other Chernobyl videos in the past, but this is my first reaction. Yep. Chernobyl, two days in the exclusion zone. By Cloth Map. Big shout outs to him. I'll leave his link in the description below and below. Let's watch. Впала з неба велика звізда палюча, як смолоскип. А впала на третю часть рік і на жерела вод. Ім'я звізди – Чернобиль. І стала третя часть вод, наче полин, і многі люди померли від води, бо гірка була. Isn't this freaking you guys out? Everyone knows something about Chernobyl. Not everyone, but still. Any disaster with such worldwide implications tends to leave a mark in history. But Chernobyl is different. It has struck a chord with us somehow, and has become the subject of an inspiration for countless pieces of media and art. Video games are no exception. In some ways, games allow us to feel a connection with the place the strongest. As players, we explore and get lost in fantasy worlds. One of those worlds exists. What would being in such a place be like? Are the depictions in media true to life? What could visiting a familiar setting show me that I hadn't already seen? What would I learn? First, I had to get there. Wow, that's loud. <laughs> Chernobyl is still under military control, so anyone wishing to visit has to jump through some hoops. Thankfully, there are many tour agencies willing to arrange everything for you. I used a company called, fittingly, Chernobyl Tour that I met up with on the outskirts of Kiev. Once we got in the van, we were handed a map and a Geiger counter. This was happening. The most important person today in this bus is, of course, our driver. His name is Vladimir. And my name is Natalia. I'll be your guide. Chernobyl exclusion zone itself is divided into two parts. 10 kilometers. That's how it comments on you. Natalia is such a fallout character. Okay. <laughs> zone, this small circle that is the closest area to the nuclear power plant and the most contaminated. And 30 kilometers on the bigger circle, that's kind of a buffer between the contaminated area and... Uh, this is from 2017, so it's pretty long ago, okay. Normally clean, clean area, relatively. Natalia then explained the reason for all the checkpoints we would encounter. Because there is no tourism in the zone. The area is still um, quite radioactive, some parts of the zone are quite radioactive. And our visit is uh, more like educational visit, so you are not going to be tourist, you're going to be something between journalists and scientists. Okay. Alright, we're here at checkpoint one. Can't actually film anything around here because there are soldiers and stuff. And since my camera was off during checkpoints, I subsequently missed a lot of video gold from Natalia who would say things like, Welcome to the exclusion zone, gentlemen. She did have a lot of helpful tips, however. 
those particles that are still present in different parts of the exclusion zone are safe for us if they are outside, but if they get into our bodies, then that might cause problems. So to avoid us getting them digested or inhaled, it's better to eat and drink our snacks and water in the bus. Loud and clear. Our first stop was a village called Zalisa. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't at least a little bit jittery. I would be, Our first encounter with the exclusion jittery. zone, up close and personal. The first building we entered was a small medical clinic. You can tell from the footage that I'm tentative. I was scared to touch anything for fear of radioactive dust. I stepped cautiously in case the decaying wood gave way. Is it safe to keep walking this way? Yeah, but be careful. Okay. Not safe. It's not safe, but be careful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Nothing is safe in the exclusion zone. <laughs> this was a key moment. I simply had to recalibrate my safety threshold. This wasn't a museum and I wasn't in America, which would have required hard hats and had all kinds of roped off areas. Instead, most of the buildings we entered were the safety equivalent of an open construction site. Nails poked out from wooden beams and we often had to dodge gaping holes in the floor. It was freeing in a way, not to be constrained from exploring, but it reminded me that this place isn't going to be around forever. Which is a shame, because in its own way, Chernobyl is beautiful. Dang it, I, I stopped my recording, I'm silly. I, I, I agree with him. Chernobyl is beautiful, and he is, they're not, it's not going to be there forever. So if you want to visit it, like, the best time to visit it is in the next couple of years. Otherwise, it could go out of existence. I was stupid and... I turn off my camera, I don't know why. I turn off. I stop recording. Okay. Anyway. It's Look also totally unlike any place I had ever been on Earth. In terms of things I had experienced, the closest associations I could make were to virtual worlds. Physically, I'd never been in an apocalyptic wasteland or wandered an abandoned city of 50,000 people. I've never had to check the ambient radiation level in real life. Yeah, I did, I, I'm, I did, I basically know most of the facts of Chernobyl, but I'm just trying to act. Gas masks aren't a normal part of my everyday experience. But in games, we see that stuff all the time. By the way, The Last of Us absolutely nailed it. The game may not be set in Chernobyl, but the post-apocalyptic details were spot on. The washed out tone of everything, the way debris accumulates in corners, the encroachment of nature right up to the outside walls and sometimes within them. Even the wallpaper looks the part. It was a weird confluence to experience those things in real life. It sounds strange, but like seeing a prehistoric skeleton in a museum, I often had to remind myself that what I was seeing was real. The apocalyptic effect was magnified the more identifiable our surroundings became. It was in these places especially that I found myself snapping back to reality. Wow. When I entered an apartment complex, I couldn't put my finger on why it felt so strange until I realized it's odd to be walking through a large building and feel a breeze. But the most striking thing I felt was a sense of trespassing. Despite these ruins being over 30 years old, there are still a lot of reminders that people actually lived there. It's not some amusement park recreation. Children's homework lays around on the floor. Kitchen appliances sit against walls. Somebody actually lived in apartment 70. If you've ever been in someone else's home while they're not there, you'll have a sense of what this felt like. Newspaper was issued, gentlemen, on 1st of March 1986. Interview with Muammar Gaddafi, former leader of Libya. And when that reality hits you, you can't help but wonder, is an apocalyptic outcome so fantastical? I'm standing in the middle of one. Wow, man, that's amazing. 
At no time was this more apparent than when our Geiger counters would freak out. Like when we visited a summer camp located on the shore of the cooling pond. To stop the beeping, Natalia simply increased the counter's threshold from 1.0 to 3.0 microsieverts. Thank you. You're welcome. If we heard the alarm again, we'd be in a real hot spot. The fear of the radiation was like a constant oh, hum no, in the back no, of our no, minds. No, 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 we had no, Natalia to tell us where it was safe to go. That said, I'm really glad we had our own Geiger counters. You can't see or feel the radiation, so without a device telling you, yes, this area is safe, you'd be afraid to take a step anywhere. Like if you were to, say, get so wrapped up in getting good footage that you became separated from your group in the middle of Chernobyl, miles from help, surrounded by invisible pockets of radiation. Yeah, sorry. It was a long first day of our two-day excursion, and I needed a break. By the time evening rolled around, I was eager for a meal and some sleep. I would our hotel was located away. within the exclusion zone in the town of Chernobyl. You, you can stay here, you be alone. All right. Gentlemen, at seven, we go downstairs. We joined a few other groups in the hotel dining room for some surprisingly good food. My fellow groupmates, two quiet German geocachers, invited me for a drink at the hotel bar afterward, but all I wanted was a shower and some sleep. As you might be able to tell, I just took a shower, uh, which is kind of the most fun part, I think, about being in a hotel uh, in Chernobyl, is that everything that you do, you do in Chernobyl. So I just took a shower in Chernobyl. Just tying my shoes in Chernobyl. Okay. Connecting to Wi-Fi in Chernobyl. Also, Chernobyl has Wi-Fi. Charging all my devices in Chernobyl. Playing Final Fantasy VI in Chernobyl. <laughs> but uh, all kidding aside, this has been um, an awesome first half of the trip uh, already. Uh, we've seen so many things. I had actually burned through 80% of my batteries. There's not a lot going on in uh, the town of Chernobyl uh, at night because there's a curfew starting at 9 p.m. Not to stay outside because if they close, if they close the gates, then it will be a problem for you to get in. They actually serve beer in the bar downstairs of the hotel, um, but I okay. am about to pass out just from uh, all the the physical exertion today, um, and I, I want to be fresh tomorrow. So uh, I'm going to transfer some footage and then uh, get some sleep. Good night. I slept for ten hours. Wow. Breakfast the next morning was a delicious pastry, some eggs, and oh my god, coffee. Before we left, though, there was one more thing I had to investigate. TV gets 11 channels. In Chernobyl. On day two, we hit the big stuff. And by big, I mean big.
The Duga is a radar station aimed directly at the United States, meant to detect incoming missiles. It is unfathomably large. Interference from the station was audible as clicks on radio sets all around the world, so much so that it earned itself a nickname, the Russian Woodpecker. <laughs> Nobody knew where or what it was, however. The secret village surrounding it, called Chernobyl II, appeared on maps as a disused summer camp. Children from the school in Chernobyl II officially graduated from the school in Pripyat, since their school wasn't supposed to exist. Pripyat did exist, but getting there required one of the more harrowing experiences of the trip. Take your geigers out, gentlemen, because probably in three, five minutes we're going to cross with you a very interesting place called Western Radioactive Trail, the way of the first radioactive cloud that was carried by the Western wind. Oh, dear, no! Follow me, please, at all times. It's very easy to get lost here. Standing in the middle of a town that used to hold 50,000 people is eerie, but mostly it's just sad. Pripyat especially displays the hallmarks of a city on the rise. The crown jewel of the Soviet Union's nuclear energy program, it was entirely self-sufficient and by all reports, a great place to live. It was a new city, only 16 years old at the time of the accident. The average age was just 26. A town looking to the future, now locked in the past. If you know one landmark in Pripyat, chances are it's this one. feel like I should be wearing a ghillie suit for this. The Ferris wheel, like the rest of the small amusement park, was, was scheduled to open a few days after the disaster happened. In a way, it's a metaphor for Pripyat, a hopeful construction destined never to see its full potential. Finally, it was time to see Ground Zero. And to the left, we have Chernobyl Nuclear Power Plant. Yay! <laughs> the new safe confinement arch, a structure built next to and then moved over the entire reactor building, had loomed on the horizon throughout our trip. Now it was time to see it up close. Really close, as it turns out. Radiation levels here were remarkably low for how close we were to the reactor. A testament to how good a job the cleanup crews did and are still doing. What did you have right now? Like 1.0? One? One? Yeah. One microzieverts. So before November 12th, levels were four microzieverts per hour here. Before November 12th of last year? Yeah, before before they covered the uh, ruins with that new construction. Wow. Yeah. Sure, it probably would have been cooler to see the busted up sarcophagus that's now covered by the arch. But this way we got to see the world's largest moving object. The whole assembly nudged into place just a few months ago. The area around the arch is so clean that we were able to have lunch just a few hundred yards away in the power plant's canteen, where workers who are still working on cleanup come to eat during the day. Again, fantastic food. 
Also, that juice tasted exactly like Gushers for some reason. On our way out, we stopped by another staggeringly large structure, an under construction cooling tower. Like the Ferris wheel, supermarket, and many other parts of Pripyat, the tower had not yet been completed when the accident happened. It all feels a little like Jurassic Park, where it was built, but it wasn't quite ready yet, and then a disaster happened. Yeah. Or a post-apocalyptic world, especially those where some things left, like kindergarten. Yeah, those are the only things left, fortunately. That's freaky. When I'm editing, zoom in on that. The size of this thing was just one more in the list of incomprehensible sights we had seen throughout our two days in the exclusion zone. But it wouldn't be the last. At some points during our trip, I felt like the exclusion zone was still alive. At no time was this stronger than in the town of Chernobyl on May 9th, Victory Day. This is the one day per year the government allows former citizens of Chernobyl and their families to return. I have no idea what this must have been like for them. But if I can get a sense of how lovely a place it was, it must be really hard for them to see it in such a state. Near the town center is a set of memorials, the most affecting being a row of signs from each evacuated village. In some cases, the signs were all that was left after cleanup crews literally dismantled and buried entire villages due to high levels of radioactivity. The last thing we saw exiting the zone underscored the future of the place. We were on our way out when Vladimir suddenly pulled over and stopped the van. Ah, do you see them guys there? Yeah? Ba, ba, ba. No, <laughs> Where do these horses come from? Originally, they are from Mongolia. Why were they brought here? For experiment. Scientists wanted to check how they will get used to this environment, to the forestry area, because Mongolia is steppes land. And also, they wanted to check how they will accommodate to the existing conditions of higher levels of radiation. But as you can see, everything turned out to be not that bad. Today we have one of the biggest herds in the world of these horses, Krzewalski horses. And likely to stay that way. The authorities didn't want us contaminating the rest of Ukraine, so at each checkpoint we passed through these incredible looking radiation detectors and waited a disconcertingly long time for the clean light to illuminate. not to pick up even a particle on you. Great job. <laughs> so let's find let's find out doses of radiation that you've accumulated during these two days. Thank you. So what do you have there? You have there eight mic receivers. There is, you go. Drew. Is that good? Uh, not bad. I have even more. I have ten mic receivers. So you're pretty fine. Ten mic receivers really not a lot you would accumulate during two or three hours of flight on board of plane because usually level of radiation um, on board of plane depends on the height of that plane and it varies between three microsieverts and six microsieverts. Ten microsieverts you could also accumulate during probably three and a half days in Kiev or if you eat 150 bananas at a time. But bananas have a natural radionuclide, potassium 40, yeah. and it's better to have potassium than cesium that we were accumulating with you today. You will not glow in the dark, gentlemen. Nothing will grow on you. So um, you shouldn't worry about that. So eat bananas. And everything will be okay. Glad to hear it. 
Leaving was bittersweet for sure. After only two days, I had kind of grown attached to the place. But before I'd even arrived in Chernobyl, I wondered, is it right for people, tourists, to come to a place of such tragedy? I asked Natalia for the Ukrainian perspective on the people who choose to come here. Usually these are young people because they are fascinated with the game they were playing, computer game. Um, a lot of sites from the exclusion zone were used in that game, so they are coming just to take a look at those sites. But also to learn more about the disaster, to see these places where everything was happening. It's part of Ukraine as an interesting place to invite people to and also at the same time to invite them to Ukraine for them to learn more about this country, about the traditions, about the situation here, about everything. I couldn't agree more. If we want to learn about the world, the reason, the impetus doesn't matter. Even if it's as seemingly insignificant as I saw it in a video game. What matters is that we make the effort and remain open to what the world has to show us. I thought I would find a devastated, depressing town a ripe target for cynicism about the human race. Instead, I found a beautiful, poignant reminder of life's fragility and perseverance, not to mention an impressive demonstration of international cooperation and preservation. Everyone will see something different, but what matters is that we go and look. Cloth Map is supported entirely by viewers like you on Patreon. If you'd like access to behind the scenes notes and documents, extended cuts, exclusive Q&As, or would just like to support the project, head over to patreon.com slash clothmap.